Hi, my name is Bree, and I have the privilege of serving as Chief of Staff here at Transformation Church. At TC, our vision is to represent God to the lost and found for transformation in Christ. And we just want to say thank you so much for tuning in from wherever you're watching from. If you haven't already, be sure to like and subscribe. We believe that God has a word just for you. So let's jump into today's message. Yeah, we've been in a series called Fresh Fruit. Somebody say Fresh Fruit. Fresh fruit. And uh, I'm excited to share today a word. Um, that's on my heart, but uh, man, I want to let you know this is such a special season of our church, and um, I'm so grateful for our church. I'm grateful for our lead pastors, pastors Michael and Natalie Todd. Can you give it up for our lead pastors? They are so special, and uh, I'm excited because this is the first week I get to preach um, as the campus pastor here, which is a crazy, exciting thing. Me and my wife get to serve as, a, as the campus pastors here at our Tulsa campus, and um, I had people in the lobby that was like, what does that mean? What, what, you, what, is that, what does that actually mean? First of all, calm down, okay? <laughs> Take a deep breath. What that means is that Pastor Michael has such a heart, such a care for this place um, that he has done just like in scripture where Jethro came to Moses and he said, listen, if you try to sit here and talk to these people, this is what the Bible says, it's not good for you or for all the people. And Pastor Michael would be in that lobby until 2028, <laughs> praying for every single person, talking to every single, but what he did, he said, you know what, I gotta raise up leaders and a team that can do that. And so that's what me and my wife are here to do. We are here to be an extension of our lead pastors to bring their vision to pass. And uh, I'm very excited for this season. Uh, we're gonna jump into the Word, okay? So I, I need you to open up your Bibles, if you got your Bibles. If you have a real Bible, you get more, more points than the person who had to charge their Bible. It's in Leviticus, you just never read that part, so if you got beef, go read all of Leviticus and then come back to me. <laughs> Be like, what is a Leviticus? Uh, Okay, I'm going to read you a portion of scripture, and then we're going to take off, okay? This is Matthew 16, starting in verse 13, and it's actually the song we just sang. It's like we planned this thing. Anyways, um, Matthew 16, 13, it says this. When Jesus came to the region in Philippi, he asked the disciples, who do people say the Son of Man is? Well, they replied, some say John the Baptist, some say Elijah. Others say Jeremiah or one of the other prophets. Then he asked them this, but who do you say I am? Simon Peter answered, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. Jesus replied, you are blessed, Simon, son of John, because my father in heaven has revealed this to you. You did not learn this from any human being. Now I say to you, you are Peter, which means rock, and upon this rock, I, come on, not social media, not YouTube, not your attendance, upon I, I somebody say I. I, I will build my church, and the powers, one translation says gates, the powers of hell will not conquer it. I could jump off this stage right now with how excited I am. I'm going to pray real quick. God, build your church. Amen. All right. Um, I'm about to tell you the whole sermon in one sentence, and then I'm just going to preach the crap out of it, and then I will come back. And if you're mad that I said crap, you're about to be real mad. Okay. Um, Throw it up on the screen, uh, my whole sermon, please, if you got that, the long sentence that I text you guys. If you could throw that up there. This is the whole sermon right here. The church. Somebody say the church. church. Say it again. Look at your neighbor and say the church. church. All right. The church, its people and its place was dreamed, designed, and destined to be the primary vehicle through which God radically redeems and restores humanity. I believe this more than I believe this jacket is green. I am telling you, the church, the people and the place was dreamed, designed and destined by God. 
This wasn't a man's idea. Nobody sat up in the corner and cooked this thing up. This was not imagined by a couple of guys. This was dreamed, designed, and destined by God to be the primary vehicle through which God restores, redeems, and transforms the entire world. And I came to remind some of us and to reignite something on the inside of you to remind you of the power of this thing we call the church. Friend, I know for some of us, it has just become a box to check. I know for some of us, we've had experiences. I know for some, there's a lot of different ideas and concepts and views and YouTube channels about the church. I get it. But let me remind you and restore to you today very clearly what the church is. The church, its people and its place was dreamed by God. You need to know this thing we're sitting in and the people group we are, this was God's dream. You know how you have dreams? Things that your, your heart is full of, things that you're so excited about, the things that overtake your sleep and that you constantly find yourself going to sleep thinking about and waking up thinking about. Can I tell you what that is for our Savior? It's the church. And, and here's the thing. So many of us, for real reasons, have slowly lost this beautiful fire and passion and desire to understand that this thing we call the church might be the greatest gift ever given to humanity. I heard one person say it this way. They said the church at its worst is still the best thing to ever happen to the world. Now here's the thing, I want to be very aware, very sensitive and very uh, um, acknowledging of all of our different experiences. But I wanna separate something. Just because you had an experience with an individual, with one place, please do not. And here's not, I'm not begging you for no other reason but for you. I just don't want you to miss out on the beauty of this thing. I just don't want you to miss out on the power of this thing. I don't want you to miss out on God's greatest dream. It's the church. There's no place like the church, friend. There's a lot of good things. There's a lot of nonprofits that help people. There's a lot of nonprofits that show up in a time of need. There's a lot of nonprofits that serve people in this life. But can I tell you, there is something unique about the church. It serves people in this life and the one to come. There's nobody, there's no place like the church. There's no place where it doesn't matter how much money you have in the bank and you're still welcome. There's no other place where it doesn't matter what you smoke or drank before you came in and you're still welcome. If you've had issues with the church, let me tell you what type of church we are. This is the church where no matter what you're going through, no matter how hurting or broken you are, this is the church. It's God's dream. It's the thing that he loves. It's the thing that he cares about. And it's the thing that he said, I We'll build it. I'm going to build my church. And here's the thing, the unique thing about the church. It's so beautiful because I I wrote this down. I want you to write this down. The church may be broken, but it's still God's bride. I want to acknowledge something for you. You want to know why it's broken? Because we sitting up in here. (laughs) Let me be. the, The issue is not with the system. It's with the people in the system. So let me separate something for you. You can go to an amazing restaurant where the chef is doing his thing, and then you have some janky server come out, be like, what you want? What you need? Or a server that don't even look at you. They act like they too bougie to do the job they applied for. It's like, I'll be feeling that all the time. Like, if you don't want to work here, quit. Like, I didn't ask you to do this. <laughs> you mad at me? You need to go to counseling. Like, I'm sorry. Your life didn't work out. I don't know. Sorry, I'll be going down a whole path. But please do not mistake the attitude of the waiter for the intention of the owner of the restaurant. It's not even their fault. It wasn't their dream. 
It's not, they didn't sit there thinking about the power it would be. They didn't sit there dreaming of how people of different races would come in. They didn't sit there thinking about how it would radically change the environment that it was around. Please do not mistake your experience with the waiter for the intention of the owner of the restaurant. He has plans for you, plans to prosper you and not to harm you. That is the church. And I'm afraid some of us have forgot that this is his bride. If you were to come up to me after this service in the lobby and you said, man, Charles, you preached so good. That was really good. And he was dressed like an avocado, man. That was so (laughs) cool. But you know, Abby, I just, I don't really, I don't really mess with Abby. I mess with you. But I just, you know, Abby's just kind of weird. You wouldn't get weird out of your mouth. It would be weak. You would be, I would, Pastor Charles stole off on somebody in the lobby. Some of y'all don't know what stole off on. Y'all don't even know what that means. That's one, that's a punch from back here. It's a specific type of punch where you ring it back and bam! <laughs> y'all, you should, you should, if you ever get in a fight, oh, this is my moment to stole off. <laughs> you gotta whine. Okay, I will go stand up. I have to keep myself in. You couldn't say, well, I mess with you, but I don't really want to mess with her. Because the two have become one. It's, it's my bride. Now, I totally understand if you had an experience that maybe was like, ah, I don't know. But, but, but there's something intrinsically connected to the heart of God and his church. Now, here's the thing. Uh, when I start talking church, I know there's a lot of different thoughts in here. So I'm going to try to bring these together so we can all work from the same premise to move forward together. When I say church, I wrote this in, in the thesis statement. Um, it's the people and the place. The people and the place. The word church in in scripture, it's a word ecclesia, okay, is the word. I'm going to teach you a little bit. We're going to go teaching right now. Come on, spiritual formation. We're about to do it right here. Welcome to the first formation class. Take out your notes. Write this down. Impress your friend in your tribe. Hey, oh, somebody. Come on, tribe. What's a tribe? Oh, just wait on us. Ecclesia. Mentioned in scripture 114 times in the New Testament. It's only mentioned twice in Jesus' lifetime, twice in Luke. The first mention of this word is the one we just read in Matthew 16. Here's what would have happened when Jesus said this word. He said, Peter, you have this revelation, you have this understanding, and now I want you to know I will build my ecclesia. And the disciples would have been like, yo, what? This was not a word they were familiar with. They would have looked at each other like, Ecla, what did he say? Ecla who? Hey, you know Ecclesia? You seen her around? Hey, what's her name? Ecclesia. Ecclesia. Uh, oh, okay. And what Jesus was doing is he was introducing an entirely new concept. This was not a bite off of some other religion. This was not some, I, he said, this, this, you ain't never seen nothing like this before. And when he's saying the word ecclesia, what this word means is ones who are called out from the world and called to God. It's the called out ones. And this messed me up. I was talking to my friend and he said this, the concept of church that we understand as a building was not in any believer's mind for hundreds of years. when When they said church, nobody thought of a building. Nobody thought of a place. They thought of the people. And this is super important for you to understand because if not, you come here and you come here and then you leave it here. Because you think church is something you go to, not something you are. I'm trying to teach you this morning. Church is not something you go to, it's something you are. John Mark Comer in his book, Practicing the Way, he says, we have confused so much the word disciple because we treat it like uh, like it's a, a verb and not a noun. Let me explain it to you. It would be like, some people use this language. I just need someone to disciple me. Disciple is not something that happens to you. It's something that you are. 
Let me make it plain. It'd be like if you said, I need you to Christian me. What? I, 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 no, 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 no. It's who you are. The tr- I don't church you. This isn't where I, I church at you. No, no, no. We are all in here as the church, becoming the church, growing as the church to walk out and be the church. You know where church is? It can be in your cubicle at 1022 on a Tuesday morning. You can start having church. And wherever the church is, there's hope. Wherever the church is, there's light. Wherever the church is, healing can happen. Wherever the church is, the good news of Jesus is preached. Wherever the church is, things change. Wherever the church is, stuff starts to act different. Wherever the church is, there are things that break open doors that nobody else could have opened up. Wherever the church is, is where our God is. You need to know this. The church is first the people and then a place. First, the people group. We are the church. It is first the people group, and then it's the place we come to. And here's the beautiful thing in the forming of the early church in Acts is where this word explodes. 72 times onto the scene is where we see church start happening. And there's a beautiful thing that happens. And I'm trying not to nerd out on this stuff, but again, we in formation class. I'm going to give it to you. There's a beautiful thing that happens And there's one theologian who writes that believers must understand the dual aspect of the church. It is first, it first has spiritual implications. The spiritual nature of the church is that when you are saved, you become a part of the church. Go read it in your Bibles. Jesus is the head of the church and we are all parts of his body. We are different members with different functions. So we have different gifts. We have different abilities. Some of y'all are just naturally the most welcoming and hosting people ever. Some of y'all are not that, but you have amazing other gifts that we need. (laughs) We are all different parts of the same body. So there's a spiritual implication that happens when you give your life to Jesus, you become a part of the global church. That's important for you to realize, friend, because this is not about us in our corner sitting behind Chick-fil-A. There's a church all around the world that is raging against the gates of hell, and we are better together than we could ever be apart. Please do not get it twisted. This is not a ploy to get you to come to Transformation Church. This is trying to get all of us to become the church. There are spiritual implications, but it is so important that we understand after we become that, the reason it's set up as a physical place is because it is the only way that you are actually formed to produce fruit. The reason we come in here, the reason it's so important that you're a part of the place of church is because it's hard to produce kindness staring in a mirror by yourself. It's hard to produce patience when you isolate yourself. Here's the beautiful thing about Jesus. Again, we're we're walking through what the church is. Jesus did take times where he was by himself and prayed, but he always came back. He always came back from his times. All throughout scripture, you'll say, Jesus, he went to be alone to pray, and then he returned to his disciples. Here is the thing. We do not run to prayer. We do not run to church. We do not run to times by ourselves with God to run away from people. We go there for the sake of the people. Your prayer time is not an escape mechanism from your other Christian friends. It is a place to go to say, God, I need patience. God, I need peace. God, help me forgive them. And then I go back to that person and I'm with them. The church, it is first the people and then it is a place. And here's the beautiful thing. What I have realized about the church is against all odds, beliefs, and questions. The church is a worthy endeavor. I know it's not perfect. I get it. But the church is God's dream. And I know we all got questions, and I know we're all real busy. But friends, I tell you, 
There is far greater things about this church. There are far greater things about his church than there are bad experiences. For every one random story you've heard about some person, some person at a church, some pastor, something, can I tell you there's millions of things you haven't heard. There's millions of faithful pastors who's been serving for 50 years and they're going to keep serving until they die. There's millions of volunteers who had a beautiful experience and became exactly who they were created to be in the four walls of a church. Please do not anybody sell you anything different. Yes, there are people, but let me tell you, the history of the church will be on our side. We are still a place of hope. We are still a place that redeems. We are still a place that takes care of people. Can I be honest with you? And this is just this is just raw because here's where I get messed up. You know, we, we just announced we're doing Ransom again. And boy, when I tell you I could punch a hole through that television, I'm so excited for Ransom. Last year, people took Ransom out of context, started running with it. You know what they didn't take out of context? The eight million dollars we gave away over the last couple of years. Ain't no news stories. Ain't no reporters searching around like, why did you guys buy out a shoe store and go give it to all the kids who don't have any shoes and don't have any family? Why are you taking care of widows and orphans? Why have you guys bought multiple houses for single mothers and given it to them? Why do you give millions of your dollars away every single year? We can't, no, 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 no. Don't get it twisted, this is the church. And whether they write about it or not, whether they say anything, we will keep being the church. We will keep blessing families. We will keep serving. We will keep giving. This is the church we're a part of, and this is the church we will be. No matter who sees it, no matter what they say, no matter who comes or who goes, we are the church and we will not back up. And here's the thing I've realized about church. Depending on your experience, there are some churches that have asked way too much. They try to get up here and preach to you that this should be your life. If you're not in church every week, come on, man, what do you do? You're going to go to hell. Don't expect me. Don't expect your kids to love God if you don't prove it to them by never missing church. And you somehow leave here more ashamed. I'm like, oh, I got to go to church. Ducking in because you late? Come on, somebody else like, dang, I was. <laughs> y'all do worship at the 10 a.m.? I ain't never. Did y'all stop doing worship at the 10? <laughs> I love you. I'm so glad you're here. But some churches ask way too much, and that's just weird. And I'll say the other end of the spectrum, some don't ask for enough, and that's weak. There is something in you. Here's the way I'll illustrate it through scripture. Um, I, I like to say it this way. There are some things that don't come out of you until something is placed on you. So like being a father didn't come out of me until the responsibility of my children was placed on me. There are some gifts, some things that God has put on the inside of you that I want to tell you, you will not get from halfway participation every six weeks. It's just not going to happen that way. There are some things that are weird. Some of that is weak. But here at TC, we have this beautifully imperfect mix that I truly believe is a worthy endeavor. And here's the thing about the church. I believe the church is a worthy endeavor and there is a way to keep it fresh. I'm gonna give you three things and we are gonna be out of here. And you can go get you some French toast. Somebody said avocado. That was a little disrespectful. I'm not going to fire back because that would be flesh. Three ways. I could fire back though. So just whoever's over there, just I'm going to keep it. <laughs> oh gosh. Okay. Let's get back to the spiritual matters at hand. Three ways to keep the church fresh. Number one, write this down. You gotta keep passion alive. You gotta keep passion al alive. Now here's the cheat code about this sermon. I'm gonna go ahead and tell it to you. This is, you could put how to keep blank fresh. You can put anything in there. You can put your marriage. You could put, 
your breath, I don't know, maybe, I don't know about your breath, but <laughs> anything in your life that you are trying, we're in this series, fresh fruit, not new, fresh. Church ain't new. I'm not here preaching to you like a new concept of church. Church has been here, it has been here long before me, it'll be here way after me. But there is a way to keep your engagement, your relationship, your participation as, remember we're setting, separating two things, you are the people. But how do I keep my engagement in this place fresh? The first thing you gotta do is you gotta keep the passion alive. Here's, here's two, two little notes on how to do that. The first thing is presence. You gotta, you gotta be there. It's your presence that keeps it fresh. And here's, let me tell you something that maybe you've never heard. The most encouraging and uplifting thing about my Sundays is seeing your face. It is, I'm serious. Your presence. It's not what you do. It's not you like, well, if I'm on a serve team and if I'm doing this and I'm running, no, 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 no. It's simply your presence. Now, there is a difference between presence and attendance. Come on. Come on. Come on. Come on. Just I want to be, you, you can be attending, but not be present. And if you want to keep this thing fresh, you got to bring your presence. I was at breakfast the other day. Um, with my grandfather and I was telling him and, and he's just navigating a hard time right now. His, his wife of over 50 years just passed away and, and it's just, it, it, it's, it was such a beautiful conversation but he was talking to me, he's like, Charles, I just don't know and you know, it's just hard navigating this and, and what I told him, I said, he was like, I just feel, so, he's, so, he's so sweet. He was like, I just feel so sad to be around. <laughs> I wanted to cry. I was like, Poppy, that's not true at all. And here's what I said to him. I said, Pops, you have no idea how grateful I am to be able to text my grandfather. It's your, it's your presence. It's just the fact that I had somebody, I could go to breakfast and sit across from a grandfather and say, what's going on? It was his presence that was the ministry. Can I tell you? You showing up and just being here with a smile on your face, giving somebody a hug, looking for your seat, walking around saying, it's just your presence that keeps things fresh. And I'm asking you, if you want to be a part and you say, you know what, I want this thing to stay fresh, it's going to take your presence if you're going to keep the passion alive. If you want to keep a marriage alive, you got to be present. If you want to keep the relationship with your children alive, you can't just be around or in attendance of their basketball game. You got to be present. The other thing, if you want to keep the passion alive, another note under that one, um, and it's kind of a secret weapon, it's people. It's people. If you want to keep your passion alive for the church, the craziest thing you could do is bring some people with you. When you, I don't know if you've ever had this experience. I have had this experience as one of the pastors of a church. I'd be inviting people to come to church and then like two seconds before they get here, I panic. Because I'm like, hopefully they don't meet, meet, meet anybody weird. And hopefully we're singing the hits today. Oh, come on, we got hits. Come on, then we got some new ones. We're trying, let's be honest. Some of y'all be like, okay, this is nice, man. Okay, what are we doing? Okay, like, but there's something that happens in my heart when I'm bringing somebody. When the relational equity I have has been put on the line, you know what it does? It has you prepared differently. Some of y'all ain't never thought about serving or being aware of anything. You bring a friend, you will be in the bathroom wiping up all that water off the counters that everybody, to, hold on, before they walk in here, let me check. How y'all doing? TC Kids, y'all need anything? We good? We got, okay, parking lot. Anybody angry over here? If you had a bad day, get the heck out the parking lot. My friend's coming, I don't need. <laughs> I don't need no attitude. 
If you didn't want to be out here, sign up for a different team. But our friend is coming today. <laughs> it's the truth. People bring a different passion out of you. And if you want church to stay fresh, invite some people. Okay, you got to keep passion alive is the first one. Oh, I remembered it. I thought I didn't. Okay. Um, you got to keep your perspective healthy. Keep your perspective healthy. Now, this one messed me up because I believe one of the most beautiful and underrated things the church has to offer is perspective. Here's the thing about perspective. You're getting perspective from somewhere. You woke up this morning and you got a perspective of the world from multiple different places. You got it from a friend you talked to. You got it from social media. You got it from your past experiences. You have formed entire perspectives. And one of the most beautiful things that the church has to offer is a healthy perspective. Go with me. You're at work. And you go up to your coworker. You're all at the water cooler talking. And uh, you're like, man, marriage is pretty tough right now. And your friend's like, your marriage is tough. The old lady won't get off my back. <laughs> and you're like, oh, yeah, I guess, you know, it's not that bad, though. Ah, well, it's not that great, though, is it? <laughs> Ain't been great since 86, brother, if you know what I'm saying. As a matter of fact, I was talking to Sheila the other day, and uh, have you seen Sheila? Whew. Sheila, hey I'm, not, hey, I'm not saying nothing. But if anything goes down, ah. Now that was one conversation. Day after day, and eventually, you have formed a perspective of the person you prayed to spend forever with. That now it's not that big of a deal. Scenario B, you show up to your tribe. That's our small groups, by the way. You're like, man, marriage ain't that good. First response, all, not all that different, because we're all human. Man, <laughs> I feel you. What's going on? Well, 10 years ago, we had this thing happen in our marriage, and ever since then, she hasn't really trusted me, and so now I feel like I'm trying to be better, but she's always kind of on me, and I get it, though, because she's hurt, but also I'm trying to become a different man the person you're in the tribe, the couple goes, oh, have you heard our testimony? Let me tell you a story. 15 years ago, my spouse was in a completely different lifestyle. I had no idea. And then God redeemed it and brought us together. And we've been in counseling. And now we actually, the whole reason we have this tribe is to talk to people like you and tell you that it's actually okay. And here's what you can do. If you start doing this and start doing, and just commit to coming back to the tribe. And have you come to Wednesday night? We do prayer on Wednesday. Come to prayer on Wednesday night. Then you're going to go to the relationship goals class and get in there. Make sure you meet. Have you met? Uh, there's this girl named Sheila. She, you, Sheila, you know, Sheila's in there. And her husband, Derek, they're an amazing couple. Sheila is beautiful. And Eric Everybody be trying to holler shit, but they've been married for 52 years and they just been rocking and uh, two different perspectives. And I have to tell you, um, if you want to keep church fresh, the most beautiful thing this church has to offer you is a perspective. But I got I got to tell you to get the perspective, you're going to you're going to have to get involved. Because there's only so much perspective I can give you. In this little segment we got up here, I'm trying to give you all the perspective. But I may not have been through what you've been through. And I may, have, may not have the testimony that you need to hear today. But when you get in, when you get on a serve team, when you start coming just early just to hang out in the lobby, 
We put couches out there, not just to make it look cool, but so that you would hang out <laughs> to maybe get some perspective. Okay, you gotta keep the passion alive, perspective healthy. The last one is keep your possession powerful. Okay. Now here's what I mean by that. First of all, I ain't talking about no devil possession. Demons don't get none of my time. I don't, churches who talk, I don't know why people, oh, are you worried about the devil? No, I ain't worried about the devil. Devils don't get none of my time. They dumb and we chilling on that. So I'm not talking about that. Go to YouTube if you to look at some weird video. I'm talking about, where, where the football at? Makaya, come here real quick. I'm a, y'all give it up for Makaya. Now you stand right there, because if I get too close, I'm gonna look short. So you stay. Uh, <laughs> everybody, every time I meet somebody, they're like, you're a lot shorter in person. I'm like, well, stole up. <laughs> Just kidding. Okay. When I'm talking possession, I'm talking how do you hold it? How do you take ownership of it? How, how, how do you embrace your church? How, you want to know how it stays fresh? You have to keep your possession powerful. And here's the thing. We're going to switch. I'm going to do what you was going to do, okay? So here's what many of us do. This is how we hold church. Wait, don't. Hold on, stop. Don't take my happiness. Don't. Okay. Give it to me, give it to me. Oh, Jesus! Get behind me, Satan. That's I got angels on my side. Don't you dare <laughs> touch the God's anointed. Okay. But when your possession is weak, it's very easy for you to fall off the mat for eight weeks. Because your possession was, then there are sometimes, you know, we got a nice little like, okay, okay, well, then you strong, boy. Okay, okay. I'm not gonna fall, I appreciate that. Then okay, okay, okay. But you see, this is, how, this is how I'm gonna hold a church. Come on, boy, what you gonna, come, boy, get off me, boy. Get off me! Yeah, you can't touch me! Oh, what you running? This wasn't part of the illustration! That's what I thought. <laughs> Give it up for Micaiah. <laughs> we didn't talk about the running, Micaiah. I don't know what that was, man. <laughs> and somebody said, ain't you been cycling? No, I fell off the wagon. <laughs> That wouldn't have happened if I had been cycling. I'm actually out of breath. I'm going to sit down. How? How do you hold the church? Pastor Michael said it last week. The goal is not just that you observe the vision. It's that you own the vision. Now I get it. This is not in a way that this is your life and this is all you do. And this is the only thing. No, 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 no. We, we, we've all got lives. You got a job. You got kids to raise. You got bills to pay. Friendships, dreams. But what I'm submitting to you is that maybe, just maybe, God dreamed up one of the most beautiful and radical ways for you to become the best version of yourself? What if God built this whole thing where we come together and we get encouraged and equipped and inspired to live in a way that we never thought was possible. And you go back out into your workplace and your ownership is so strong that you realize, 
man, I got, I got so encouraged on Sunday. And then I was in the lobby talking to somebody and I met somebody new and they actually just moved here from, from Florida. And I, I remember I moved three years ago to be here and, and I was so inspired by the faith. And it just reminded me that, man, God really has taken care of me since I moved here. And gosh, he's so good. And, and then you're sitting at work on Monday and your friend's like, I don't know what I'm going to do. And I just feel like I've been in this situation. And no, you know, I actually, I do this thing. Um, every Friday we throw this party at my house. That's my secret word. That's how I'm going to get all my friends to come to my tribe. I'm going to be like, I throw this party and it's the dopest party you've ever been to. And everybody's super cool and everybody's super chill. And they're so cool. You don't have to be drunk to have fun. Actually, it's like way. They're like, I don't know about that. Come see for yourself. I'm just. I'm completely sold out to this thing. I just, trust me, if, if I, I, this was not my like plan, like the church, I thought I was going to do something else and a bit like, but this is, it's the church for me. It's God's dream. It's all of us being in here. Now, here's the thing. I have to take an excerpt because there's a beautiful thing. God has done in allowing this ministry to expand all over the world. And there are people who are watching from all over the world. I want you to know you are a part of this church. You, you are a vital, important, and valuable part of this church. Logging on and having friends over to your house and, and the way you, you're keeping passion alive by sharing this and sharing the sermons and, and giving and tithing. TC Nation, you are an epic part of this church. And here's what I realized. I was talking to my dad, and it's funny, I just, it's like this passion for the tr church was transplanted in me. Like I didn't even, I didn't even want to have it. But me and my dad were talking yesterday and he said, you know what, Charles? It's always been the church for me because the church has always been there for me. And I'm just thinking, there's nowhere else I could have gone. There's this beautiful portion of scripture and I'm about to close right now. We're going to be out of here by 1135. We're going to get out of here. It says this, Jesus talking and he's talking to the disciples and Jesus says, are you going to leave too? And the disciples say one of the most beautiful things. He replies, he said, who else will we go to? I'm telling you, I wanted to go a lot of other places. I wanted to go out and do my thing. But I didn't have nobody else to go to. It was the church. It was getting in this room and when we worship together, there's nothing like it. Even if it's not your style, even if it's not your flavor, there's, there's nothing like a group of imperfect people singing to a perfect God. There's nothing like this church. There's nothing like being in a place where you can come in and say, you know what? I don't have all the answers. I still got some questions, but there's nothing like the church. I heard this story and I'll close with this. I heard this story. This guy was telling, he said he had two dogs and uh, when they were really young, they would sit on the back porch and they had all this land and they would look out onto the land. And they would both be sitting there looking for a squirrel and the second they would see him a movement in the trees or one run out they would both take off sprinting and they would chase these squirrels with all their heart he said but as time went on Daisy her eyesight got bad and said she stopped being able to see the squirrels but what Daisy learned is instead of looking out into the trees for the squirrels She turned and she looked at the other dog and she couldn't see it for herself. But when she saw something happen with him, when the hair on his neck stood up, when, when he started to twitch, when, when his ears sat up, she realized, I don't know what it is, but I can take off running. 
Can I tell you that is the church at its greatest? Is you walking in not being able to see where God's taking you? Is you walking in not knowing what he's doing in your life? And sometimes you don't have the energy to look for yourself because you feel like you've lost sight. But can I tell you the reason it's important to have your presence? It's because sometimes you're not looking up this way, you're looking at your neighbor. And you're thinking, man, if they can still worship, they clearly feel something. There must be something going on in their life. I'm telling you, friend, the church was a dream of God. you still be the primary vehicle through which he restores and redeems humanity. Standing all over this room. I'm gonna ask you to stay still just for a few moments. If you don't have to leave, I'm gonna get you out of here. 1135. I'm telling you, I know you really want a pancake. I get it, so. <laughs> they stopped serving it too, I know, it's okay. <clears throat> Here's the thing, I wanna to talk to two groups of people. The first group of people, actually I'm gonna, I'm gonna separate it into three. First group of people is um, maybe church just doesn't feel fresh anymore. You're here, but it just, it doesn't have that same energy like it used to. The scripture says it this way, return to me the joy of my salvation. Some of us, maybe you've just lost that fresh fire. You lost that feeling like you have a place to fit. Here's the assumption in a church this size. Oh, they got it all figured out. They must not need me. Can I tell you nothing could be further from the truth? But if you're in here and you say, you know what, I, I just, I want that spark back. I've lost something. I've lost the, the even desire to be present. I've lost my desire to want to even bring my friends. I used to maybe be excited about that or honestly, I've got some weird perspectives and I don't even know what to do or maybe my, my ownership of this thing hasn't, hasn't even been that strong. But today I, wanna, I want that back. I, want, I, I need some kind of spark. I need something. If you're in this room and that's you, you say, you know what, I want, I want, I'm just going to ask you to do something. I just want you to raise your hand right now. If you say, you know what, I, I, this thing is kind of, I need help with this thing being fresh. Here's the thing, I want to pray over you. Jesus, I thank you for every hand lifted. I pray supernaturally there will be a fire ignited in the hearts of your people for them to come alive, for their passion to be awakened, for their perspective to be alignment with you, Lord God, and for their ownership, their possession to be something that's beautiful. You can put your hands down. There's a second group of people in here. Everybody can look at me for a second. There's a second group of people in here and uh, I'm gonna do something bold that I don't know if we've done in a while. I'm gonna ask you to help me. Me and my wife, we are more gassed than ever before to see this Tulsa campus reach our community. But the truth is we can't do it by ourselves. We need people who say, you know what? I'm down. I'm down to reach this city. I'm down to represent to every single person. I'm down to show love to every neighbor. I'm down to serve. I'm down to show up early to help set up something. I'm down to come up in the offices during the week and, and call people who it was their first time and tell them how much we love them. I'm down to, I just, I wanna be a part of building this thing. There, this isn't for everybody. So don't feel no pressure of like, but there are some of you in here, you feel like, no, I, I wanna help build this thing. I wanna help do, I'm here. Like I'm not going nowhere and I am here to build this church. What I'm gonna ask you to do is directly after service, like 10 or 15 minutes after service is over. What time is it now? It's 11.34. Ooh, I gotta speed up and keep my word. Okay. <laughs> right across here in the South Ballroom, me, Abby, and our campus staff, Pastor Amberly, our tribe's pastor, we are gonna be in there. And we are gonna have our first 
made up campus core team meeting. Y'all didn't know, we was launching a church in Tulsa, Oklahoma. And if you say, you know what, I'm down. I want help. I want to be a part. I don't know what that means. I don't know how much time I got. And I don't even need to figure out all those details. But I want to help build this church. I'm going to ask you after service. Get you, listen, here's what we've had uh, TC kids prepared. They're going to keep your kids. Some of y'all going to come just for an extra 10 minutes without your kids. <laughs> but I want you to meet us 15 minutes after service is over. So let's, let's go with 1150, 1155. We're going to get started right across here in the South Bar Room. Now, some of y'all, this ain't new. Some of y'all been volunteering, serving. Y'all been holding this vision down since GCC. So this ain't nothing. Give it up for all the people who've been down. But if you want to make a fresh commitment to help us build this campus, I would love to see you in that room. Every head bowed, every eye closed. We're going to get out of here. If you're in this room and you haven't accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior, it's the greatest decision you could ever make, the greatest thing that changed my life, and it's the biggest fresh start that I have ever seen happen in my life and through the life of so many people I love. If you want to accept Jesus into your life, here is the good news. He loves you right where you are. He is proud of you and he wants nothing more than a relationship with you. You do not have to earn it, but you simply receive it. If you are in this room and you want to take the step to give Jesus Christ your life, I'm going to count to three and I want you to lift your hands. When you lift your hand, it is an outward expression of an inward decision of what's happening in your heart. If you want to accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior, I'm going to count to three. One, he loves you. Two, he is so proud of you. Three, all around the room, lift your hand if you want to accept Jesus. I see you right here. I see you, brother. So proud of you up there. I got both of y'all over here. Amazing. I see you right there. Amazing. So proud of you. So proud of you. I see y'all. So proud of you. Everybody out loud. Would y'all repeat this prayer with me? Everybody say, Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for loving me. Dear Jesus, I admit I've made mistakes. I pray you would save me, change me, transform me. I'm yours. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Hey, can you celebrate people who just made the decision? Oh, come on. Let's celebrate people who just made the choice. Thank you so much for watching this message. We pray that it encouraged you. We also want to say thank you to our faithful partners and givers here at Transformation Church. It's because of your generosity that this vision has been made possible. If you'd like to partner with us in giving, you can text GIVE to 828282 or you can visit our website. Also, be sure to like, subscribe, and check out our other sermons, as well as our live Sunday experience that begins at 1045 a.m. Central Standard Time. Now go out and live a transformed life.